the impact of this school closure that we've had, this remote learning that we defaulted to, is going to be impacting for years to come if we don't do something to close the gap? How do we do that? Well, number one is resilience is the answer to it. But I think a big mistake that parents think is there's only a set window. It's too late. Or it started when he was three. It's not too late for any of us or the entire counseling industry would go out of business. So first, we add it to the plate. And second of all, we start chunking this whole thing called resilience. When I was writing Thrivers, my goal was to look at seven traits that are highly correlated to success. Not every kid needs all seven of those. Can you tell us the seven? Oh, sure. It starts with confidence. Confidence is knowing your strengths. And let's help our kid focus more on their strengths as opposed to their weaknesses. 77% of the time, we try to fix the kid as opposed to help them learn where you're going with your strengths. You know, the simplest thing that Amy Warner discovered, many of the children who really had extreme adversity in their life had a hobby. And the hobby, I didn't make a difference. It was uh, guitar or books or hiking. They would go to that to decompress. Dr. Phil, when I was interviewing kids and said, what's your hobby? Many of them looked at me absolutely dumbfounded. Who's got time for a hobby? So that's number one. We've got to start with that. Maybe we start being talent scouts. We walk around the house and we look at tuning into what our kids are good at as opposed to what their weakness are and start pointing that way. Another one would be empathy. We need social competence. We know that many children who are resilient have ability to connect with others. Now we've got loneliness factors and and social competence and empathy is made up of social skills. So if that's the part that's low, then let's start focusing in on how to help our kids get along. The third one is every kid in the world needs self-control coping strategies, how to get rid of that stress so it doesn't become so darn unhealthy. There's at least 30 strategies in the self-control strategies, that chapter on how to help them. So you find one. You know, here's another thing that kids said, Dr. Phil. They said, I know you're teaching us self-control strategies, but it's not like a one-time course in a health unit. You got to give us a repertoire of stuff that we can actually do in the here and now. Then we got to practice it. Like on the show, I was teaching Kira the one-two breathing, which is so simple. As soon as the stress comes in, when you start identifying what your stress signs are, you take a slow, deep breath from real deep in your abdomen, like you're riding up an elevator, keep focusing on on the breath, hold it, then slowly let it out. The exhale is twice as long as the inhale. Kids said that really works, but unless you help us practice and practice and practice and practice when we're calm, it doesn't kick in. What Dr. Bohr was talking about here, a one to two ratio of inhale and exhale is not as simple as it sounds. It has to do all the way to the cellular level of the exchange of oxygen and calming yourself down. So you can hear something like that and go, oh yeah, you had some lady on there talking about breathe slow. No, No, she's talking about regulating yourself. It's almost meditative. It causes you to really slow down and exercise control in the face of stress, which again, as I said earlier, you observe yourself doing. And that's just one of several things that she talks about in this chapter on self-control. I said she wasn't a theoretician, that she puts verbs in her sentences This chapter on self-control puts your child back in command of their ship. And I can't tell you how important role-playing is. If you take these things in her self-control chapter and you actually role-play this with your children so they practice it and do it, this can be an absolute game changer. Oh, Uh, Thank you, because you also nailed something else on that one that I think we're doing wrong as parents. We tell our kids these things instead of showing them. Any skill is better if you show it, not tell it, then you do it over and over again. With little kids, go teach the teddy bear. For bigger kids, go teach someone else. For bigger kids, bigger when teens, they roll their eyes at you and I'm going, come on, the most elite forces in the world called Navy SEALs. This is what they do. You can do this. All you need to do is keep practicing and practicing. The exhale's got to be twice as long as the inhale. Yeah, And these Navy SEALs, they don't do it till they get it right. They do it till they can't get it wrong because their life depends on it. 
There you go. That's it. I think the other thing with parents when they're stressed is, oh my gosh, how am I going to feed that in? I got so much other things to do. Just if you take one thing, like one, two breathing, and you weave that in one or two minutes a day, and you do it for a month, that alone is going to help your child learn a skill they're going to use the rest of their life. There's dozens of ideas in there. Don't do them all or your kid will never let you read another book. Find what works for your family. And you keep working and working and working on it because your new goal as a mom or a dad is to help your learn your child learn to cope without you. That's that's how they're going to get through a very uncertain world. They're going to need a new skill set. Your next one is integrity. Talk about that a little bit. Well, fascinating enough is that integrity is that piece that's that strong moral code and compass. And people go, what that have to do with resilience? There's a whole bunch of different kinds of challenges. Some kinds of challenges are the stress challenges, but integrity would be the challenge like the peer pressure challenge. Is that right? Is that wrong? When we look at kids who get over that hump, They have you as the parent planting very strongly in them what our beliefs are in this family. And that means it's a lot and lot of conversations. Dr. Phil, the easiest thing I've ever seen, there was an incredible girl named Mia Dunn. Every high school teacher said, would you go figure out how that kid came to be such a kid with amazing integrity? So I pulled her aside. She was a senior in a Florida upscale school. And I said, okay, Mia. Every single high school teacher is asking me to find out how you got the integrity, how to do it. She laughed and she said, oh, it was how I was raised. I said, okay, how were you raised? She said, oh, I remember when I was six, my parents called us, my two brothers and me into the family room. There was all this chart paper and marking pen. My dad said, sit down. We're going to figure out what kind of family we want to be remembered for. So we're going to brainstorm kinds of words. Mom's going to write them all down. I don't care what the words are, respectful, responsible, honest, whatever. We're going to write them all down, and then we're going to vote. At the end of, I don't know how many little bits of time, mom ran out of room on the mark, on the all of the chart paper, and dad said, let's vote. And we all voted for honest. I said, okay, easy. So how'd you remember it? She laughed, and she said, it was impossible not to. My mother must have said it 50 times a day. Remember, we're the honest done. She dropped us off at school. Hey, remember the honest done. We'd be reading a book. Those guys were honest done. They said it so much, we became it. Oh, I love that quote, because that's how you instill integrity. You got to be the value system for your kids. Stand up and start embedding it in your child so they become what you want them to be. Yeah, it's so important that you have rituals and traditions in your family, and they take pride in that, where you just say, we just don't do that. We do this. And that's so important for their identity. So important. Okay, next. Curiosity. Yes, I curiosity. love curiosity. That's that kid who thinks out of the box with ideas and people. The easiest one on that one, when you go, what the heck does that have to do with resilience? It's not to raise a kid who's an Albert Einstein creative child, but it's a child who realizes that when they're confronted with a problem, there's no problem so great that can't be solved. And that's what you're looking for, for agency. The easiest way to do that from this moment on is when your child comes home or he's sitting there with a problem, don't solve it for him. Instead, what's bugging you, sweetie pie? Say it. And then you're teaching the simplest thing that there is called brainstorming 101. Keep a poker face because some of the ideas they come up with are going to be off the chart. But what's one thing you could have done? What's another thing for a kid who goes, how long do I have to do it for one minute till the sand runs out? But if you keep brainstorming and then you're all done and you go, okay, now get rid of things that aren't safe, wise, or responsible. What's the one thing you're going to choose? Good. Now let's create the plan. What you're doing is creating agency. So when the child is faced with a real life problem, he's got it. And that's, again, what that thriver has. It's okay, mom. I can do it myself. Oh, there's your moment to get a spa day, mom. I got it. Yeah, that's so important. Again, that's them observing themselves, figuring something out. And even if they're off the charts with some of them, that's so important. What we were talking about before of how we're preparing these kids in school, but it's perseverance. Yes, it's perseverance. Here's the problem, Dr. Phil, is that every parent wants the kid to persevere right this minute. 
And what I discovered is that of these seven traits, you got to have that self-control in order to have the buffer or self-confidence is really wonderful in order to help that kid persevere. In fact, the other thing I learned that was my aha moment is that isn't one trait or two traits, but you put any two together, they multiply the outcome. So it's like superpowers for a child. Self-control and perseverance, wonderful. Carol Dweck has got the greatest solution on perseverance. Stop praising them for the end product. What you get? Did you get the 100%? What's the grade? Instead, you make success in your house become a four-letter word, G-A-I-N. Yesterday, you were here, sweetie. You got 33 right. Tomorrow, you're going for 34. It's one step, one step, baby step. Success is always in steps. You never win the gold medal tomorrow. You win it in little teeny increments along the way. And, and that's the goal on perseverance. So wonderful on the science that tells us how to help our kids hang in there and not quit. The last one you mentioned is optimism, which is so important. You're watching a group of kids who have been every day for the last two years turning on a TV set and seeing how many people died today. Now you've got a live feeds of a horrific war. You've got images that are really impacting our kids. And many of them say, I just feel hopeless. I'm really worried about the world. I think this one is one of the easiest things from NYU that said, images that our kids see either elevate their empathy and their optimism, or they create doom and gloom. Okay, one of the easiest things you can do on that one, I think we don't do nearly enough. Look what the research says and apply it. Go to the back page of the newspaper every day. There's incredible, glorious stories about real kids doing wonderful stuff. Cut out the news, blow it up. Now you got another family meeting or an interesting just dinner discussion. Did you hear about true story? Here, I love this one. The two kids in Ohio, they were so worried about the neighbor next door Empathy 101, because she's 80. She's all by herself, mom. She's so lonely. Can't we do something? What can you do, sweetie? I love mommy. What can you do, kids? Can we drag our cellos to her porch and do a cello concert? Good idea, said mom. They drag their cellos, go to the porch, knock on the door. They social distance. They do a little cello concert. All the neighbors come out. They're crying. Mom's crying. She puts it on Facebook. It goes live. What happens is the virtual of all the rest of the children in the world look at it and go, I can do that too. You're elevating their heart. You're seeing tuba concerts in Sacramento, flute concerts in New York. We've got to show our kids the good stuff that's doable. Now they put it in their hearts. They've got the agency. That's what builds hope. 